Brown Company present The Cavalcade of America. Good evening, everyone. This is Gabriel Heater. Every schoolboy or girl in America would be quick to recognize a famous painting which shows George Washington crossing the Delaware. And to every one of us, old and young alike, it brings a reminder of a Christmas night 162 years ago, when a ragged, forlorn, and apparently defeated army made an electrifying attack, and in one quick, brilliant stroke, a cause which appeared lost brought new hope to men who had known defeat and retreat. New hope to men who had suffered every kind of privation and new faith in George Washington. A story to go down a corridor of time. But there's another not so well known of a plain everyday New Jersey butcher who's our hero on tonight's cavalcade. His name was John Honeyman. And tonight, for a holiday greeting, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra ring up the curtain with the hit song from Sing Out the News. Franklin D. Roosevelt Jones. gentlemen, the narrator and chronicler of the Cavalcade of America, Thomas Chalmers. This is the story of a hero without a monument, a man who gave priceless service to our cause during the early days of the War for Independence. His name is John Honeyman, a butcher of Greekstown, New Jersey. There are no tablets to John Honeyman, obscure, almost unknown. He is but briefly mentioned in a few American histories. Like hundreds of his friends and neighbors, Honeyman had but little interest in the struggle for freedom which the Continental Army of George Washington had been waging for months. 
Among the tradesmen, artisans, and farmers in New Jersey, life continued substantially unchanged. Lexington and Concord were regarded as merely local skirmishes, and in general, an attitude of indifference prevailed throughout the colony. But suddenly, in the late autumn of 1776, the war burst like a flame in New Jersey, sweeping through the very heart of the state. It was no longer possible to be indifferent, and to John Honeyman fell a mission that was destined to make his life a story of exceptional significance in the annals of the American Revolution. Honeyman's role in the drama of the War for Independence began one day in the little town of Hackensack on the west bank of the Hudson River when General George Washington summoned him into a secret meeting. Honeyman, the people of New Jersey do not realize that we are fighting for complete freedom. This is not war to them. It's another political flare-up between the Whigs and the Tories. A decisive stroke, a great victory, will unite the people behind our cause. That is why I've sent for you. I don't understand, sir. I have a plan, Honeyman. But it entails a mission without thanks. Well, what is the mission, General Washington? I want you to be a spy. Honeyman, I need information desperate. General, I'm in no position to get information. You're a butcher. The enemy needs food. Sell to them. From the orders you get, you'll learn where the enemy plans to encamp. If you give me this information, I'll have knowledge of their movements. But why will they buy from me? If you were a Tory, Honeyman. I see. I warn you, you'll be despised. Nobody will respect you. And it will mean disgrace and scorn. Yes, I know. Not even your wife must know the truth. But the enemy will trust you, Honeyman. Now, when you get information, allow yourself to be captured and brought to me. Then I'll arrange for your escape. Well, Honeyman, I'll be the best Tory in the colony, General Washington. Down with these Tories. The Redcoats will not defeat us. The Tories will do it for them. Let us hound these Tories out of New Jersey before it's too late. I tell you, John Honeyman is a Tory. Didn't I see those Redcoats over in his butcher shop last week? We know how to deal with Tory. We've stood enough from the Tory honeymoon. Have nothing to do with them, I tell you. Do you know why our men are being driven back? It's the likes of Tories. They're the villains that are doing it. Honeyman is one of the worst. The traitor, the lobster back. This is no time. Boys, keep right on marching. Left, 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 right, left. Hey, am I too late to be in your army? We don't let Tories in our army. Lobster back. I'm not a lobster back. Your father is a lobster back, Tom Honeyman. That makes you one, too. Go on over to the Redcoat camp with all the other Tories. You and your father both. Storm the lobster back up the street. Don't you dare. Run while you can, lobster back. I won't. All right, boys, storm the lobster back. There. That'll show them what we think of Tories. Attention! Forward! March! Left! 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 Right! Left! Left! Good morning, Betsy. How are you this morning? What do you want, Martha Honeyman? Why, Betsy? Come, I'm busy. Well, Betsy, I just wanted to borrow some coals. Our fires died out. I'll have no dealing with the wife of a Tory. This is the last time I'll be stopping in your shop, John Honeyman. Here, take what I owe you. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Oliver. We've done our best to send your wife good joints and cutlets, haven't we, Martha? My reasons are more important than good cutlets. I think you understand. Your wife here does anyway. Good day. There you are. Now, for the last time, John Honeyman, are you a Tory? Why, Martha, what... Tell a... me straight out. They all say you are. Who? The neighbors. They notice them for days that folks haven't been dropping in to pass the time of day. 
And Tommy has been left out of things, not playing like he used to with the neighbor's children. Well, it must have come from seeing the redcoats in the shop. Redcoats? You're dealing with redcoats? Yes. You must sell no more to them, John, for my sake and for Tommy's. But I have a contract, Martha. A contract with whom? With the British quartermaster. He's made a trade with me to furnish beef critters for the Hessian army for the next month. And you're being paid well for it, aren't you? Yes, it's a good contract. It's not right. Not if we want to live peaceable with our neighbors and if we want to help General Washington. Well, maybe I could sell beef critters to General Washington if the Hessians had only stopped chasing him. Oh, what's the use talking to you? Do as you please. Martha. I'm leaving. Sell your red coat friends your best meat. But I won't stay here to help you. Washington's force at the time was near New Brunswick. The succession of defeats and the enforced retirements from Long Island to Manhattan to Fort Washington and now across New Jersey had discouraged and depleted the army. The intelligence service was disrupted. Washington didn't know and couldn't find out what British forces were following him. He was holding on with dogged determination, but he didn't know at what moment he might be trapped and the last hope of the American cause snuffed out. It was about this time that John Honeyman went to Washington's headquarters again. Excellent disguise, Honeyman. Did you have much difficulty getting through the lines? Well, once or twice, sir, I thought I was recognized. Luck was with me. Good. I hope it continues. This is extremely important news you are bringing me. Now, if uh, you... General Washington. Yes? General, there's something I must say. I want to change a disguise for an army uniform. I want to enlist. Enlist? Honeyman, you can't. You're too valuable as a Tory. Not myself, I'm thinking of, sir. It's my wife, my family, my son. I can take care of myself. They're, they're helpless. They're, they're stoning my son. They won't speak to my wife. I should have realized that. I, um... Suppose I write an order clearing your family, but not you. Would that serve your purpose? Yes, sir, I think it would. Good. Then I'll write it at once. <laughs> good people of New Jersey and all others of may concern. It is ordered that the wife and children of John Honeyman of Griggstown, the notorious Tory, now within British lines and probably acting the part of a British spy, should be protected from all harm and annoyances. This is no protection to Honeyman himself. Signed, General George Washington. Yeah. Honeyman the Tory became a familiar figure behind the British lines and in the surrounding country, where he rounded up and bought cattle for delivery to the Redcoats. A few weeks later, the British troops, consisting of a force of Hessians commanded by Colonel Rawl, thundered into Trenton, confidently expecting to surprise and capture the ragged brigades of George Washington. But great was the enemy consternation at finding an almost deserted village. Washington's army had vanished. And although Lord Howe, who arrived in Trenton on the heels of the Hessian advance, sent men swarming up and down the river searching for boats, it was discovered that Washington's troops had taken every boat on the New Jersey shore. To the British High Command, however, Washington was still regarded with contempt. Lord Howe saw no need to remain in Trenton, left the village in charge of Colonel Rawl and his Hessians. Then, on December 22nd, John Honeyman, Honeyman the Tory, drove a small herd of cattle into Trenton, left them standing in front of Hessian headquarters, and went in to report to the commander. Morning, Colonel Raw. Oh, it is you, Honeyman. Uh, I got some cattle out front here for your quartermaster. Well, that is good news. My men will be glad to see that beef. Now we can give him a Christmas dinner that will be a Christmas dinner. All you need now, Colonel, is a bit of wine. <laughs> Never fear, we've got wine. <laughs> Four hogsheads of it. Four hogsheads? Well, that won't go for a whole brigade. Oh, I haven't got a whole brigade. No? No, not more than a thousand men. Why, they, they could all get roaring drunk on the ration I intend to issue for Christmas. And like as not, they will, too. <laughs> well, Colonel, 
How about signing for the beef critters out front as I've got to hike over to the next detachment? Uh, how far north is the next post? Nobody north of us. We are on the flank. Oh, that makes a lot of work for you, I guess. Work? Sure. Don't you have to patrol up and down the river? What for? Well, after all, there are some of the enemy left. <laughs> A half dozen starved ragamuffins. <laughs> what could they do to my train Hessians? <laughs> uh, if we had some boats, we would soon make short work of them. But confound the rascals, they have made away with all the boats. Why don't you build some? Ah, oh, why should we? We get across the river as soon as it freezes over. <laughs> we catch the last of the rebels then. Mm. Well, Colonel, good luck. I hope you won't be in too big a hurry to capture them. Huh? What's that? I'll be out of a job and so will you. <laughs> <laughs> right enough. <laughs> Well, uh, let's have a look at your cattle that I signed for. Yeah, here they are, right out in front. How many did you say there were? Yeah, Twenty-two critters. Uh, there was when I drove them up. Mm, look a little scrawny. Uh, best I have, sir. Two, four, five, seven, ten, thirteen, fifteen, nineteen. Twenty-one is all I make on him. Twenty-one? Four, seven, twelve, eighteen. Eighteen. Twenty-one. <laughs> one must have strayed away. Well, sign for twenty-one and I'll go out looking for the other one. Right. Let's have to build. Twenty-one in good condition. There you are. Hope you find the other one. Uh, where's that road off the left, Joe? Oh, that's the river road. Uh, Quitter might have gone that way. Better keep a sharp lookout if you go down there. Why? Some of those ragamuffin rebels might be on this side of the river. Oh, come across the river, do they? Yes, once in a while. You don't dare bother us, but they might pick up a civilian. Maybe I'd best send a soldier. Ah, oh, if I could take care of myself. I got my whip and this halter. <laughs> that ought to be enough to scare them away from you. They'll think I'm the hangman coming to get them with a halter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's that critter gone to? Serve us. Serve us. Serve us. What's that noise? I don't know. There, I see him. A farmer cracking his driving whip. Yeah. What's he got in his other hand? Looks like a piece of rope. Oh, no use stopping him. Lie low. We want to get one of them hit. He's getting closer. Quiet. Say, I know that fellow. Oh, what about it? Keep still, I say. No, listen, Corporal. We've got to capture him. General issued orders about him. Who is he? Honeyman. Honeyman the Tory? That's him. Let's grab him. Men. We're going to take this fellow. Oh, Quiet till I give the signal. Then jump. Oh, boy. Well, that dang critter gone to... I figure maybe... Seize him, man. Get him. Hold his feet all right. Let me up. All right. Stand him up. But hold him. What do you mean? Can't a farmer hurt his cow? Farmer? We know you. Honeyman, Tory. Let's waste no time with spies. He's got a halter. There are plenty of trees around here. Listen, you can't. What are we waiting for? We can't hang him here. Who'd know about it? It's the only way to deal with spies. You can't do it. Hold your tongue, you blasted lobster back. Come on, I've got the halter. I'm in command here. I order you to follow regulations. You'll get a trial at the camp, a quick one. Now bring him along. How say you, sir? Guilty of high treason. How say you, sir? Guilty of high treason. How say you, sir? Guilty of high treason. John Honeyman, you've been found guilty before this court of acting as a spy in the service of the King's forces, the little army and the people of the independent 13 United States of America. The sentence that this court now pronounces upon you is that at sunrise tomorrow, you'll be hanged by the neck until you be dead. Yes? I have a warrant for you to sign, General Washington. Oh, come in, Colonel Reed. A spy has been captured and duly convicted. Here is his death warrant. Prisoner's name? Honeyman, General. John Honeyman. Honeyman. Did he confess any information? None, sir. I think you'd better bring him here. To see you, sir? Perhaps I can find out something from him. As you wish, General Washington. Bring the prisoner in, Coppo. Yes, sir. In here, you. Very good, Colonel Reed. Will you leave us alone? You're sure you can handle him, General? He seems to be well bound. I think it's safe enough. Very well, sir. 
I'll have the detail. Wait outside. Honeyman, or whoever you are, I can think of nothing more despicable than being a spy. They didn't give me a fair trial, General Washington. Well, Honeyman, I hope you have news. Across the river in Trenton, there aren't but a thousand Hessians. Who's commanding? Colonel Rawl. No patrols up or down the river. Nobody at all north of him. And it's six miles to the nearest post in the south of him. A thousand men, no patrols. It might be possible. It'd be more than possible if you tried it on Christmas night. The colonel is making a big Christmas of it. Four hogsheads of wine, heavy wine. Has Rawl taken any precautions against surprise? No, none that I could see. It's our opportunity. We'll cross the river Christmas night. And when we capture Trenton, I shall arrange for your escape. Very well, General Washington. Thank you, Honeyman. Uh, Colonel Reed. Yes, sir? Turn the prisoner over to the corporal. Have him taken to the guardhouse. I won't sign his death warrant yet. A few days in prison may make him do some talking. Corporal? Yes, sir? Take charge of your prisoner. Yes, sir. All right, call him. Look sharp. All right. March. Colonel Reed? Well, General? It's only a few days until Christmas, isn't it? Why, uh, yes, sir. I'm thinking it might do us all good to have a little party at Christmas. Uh, indeed it might, uh, General Washington. We'll have our party across the Delaware in Trenton. Trenton? But the Hessians are in Trenton. So they are. But we'll be there on Christmas night when they least expect us. Uh, but the Delaware, it's choked with ice. I know. But it's Trenton Christmas night. Heading into that chunk of ice. Smash it quick. Hurry, hurry, men. Hold harder, lad. Yes, sir, Mr. Washington. How are the other boats faring, Colonel Reed? It's a long pull, and this ice is dangerous. Pull, lad. Not that I know, but it's Christmas and I'm happy anywhere on Christmas. Oh, we'll <laughs> sing. Let, let's all sing. Everybody, come over here to the punch board. What shall we sing? Yankee Doodle? <laughs> <laughs> let's let go, Colonel Vaughan. Oh, no, no, we sing. Yeah. You, you are, your hands, you sing. Oh, such a long time. If I sleep, I solace me What's that? This is... Cannon! Turn What happened, Sergeant? The Yankees, run for your life! Take a stand, you swine on quick before the Yankees spit us on your planet! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Good morning, Mistress Honeyman. Good morning, Master Oliver. Well, I think our lobster back friends learned a lesson at Trenton. Yes, yes, they did. Good morning, Master Oliver. Good, Good morning, morning Martha. Good morning. Martha, you'll have to hurry if you're going to the celebration. I don't think I'll go, Bessie. I'd feel out of place. Oh, but we all know you're not a Tory like... Left, right, left, like... Left, yes, I know, Bessie. Left, like John left, Honeyman. Left, oh, you must. Right, and left, bring Tommy. Yes, left, you should, Mistress left, Honeyman. Left, left. Right, left. Well, here comes the Continental Army now. Good morning, Master Tommy. Oh, he's not Tommy. He's General Honeyman. Tommy, you've been playing in the mud again. We've been chasing the lobster backs, Mother. That's the spirit, General. We're going to fight for General Washington when we grow up. Attention. Forward march. Left, 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 right, left. story of a hero without a monument, but the effect of Washington's victory at Trenton was immeasurable. It crystallized the doubtful element in the colonies and united the people behind George Washington. It started a chain of events that led to a victorious turning point in the struggle for American freedom. John Honeyman suffered the contempt of the very men and women he was trying to serve, an outcast and despised. And yet the story of the 
Greenstown butcher who posed as a Tory that he might better save his country is a matchless chapter in American history. This is Gabriel Heater again, speaking for the DuPont Company and wishing you a happy new year, everyone. A new day, a new week, and a new year. And every barometer gives assuring promise it will be a year rich in good living for millions. A year rich in new milestones for all America. And all of us on the cavalcade of America hope you'll find your share in the better days which loom ahead. Wherever you turn, you find people keen, expectant, and hopeful, symbolized in men going back to work. And what we enjoy in peace and freedom, symbolized in one word which grows in volume all over America tonight, confidence in tomorrow. The confidence expressed in such a great spectacle as the San Francisco 1939 World's Fair, a dream come true. A living reality to inspire us all to feel the greater days which wait ahead. The World's Fair on San Francisco Bay, a treasure island born of the brain and brawn and rich dreams of everyday Americans, calling on men everywhere to forget war and deadlock, forget quarrels, and come to a great pageant of the Pacific to see what American industry and science are doing for better living for millions everywhere. And almost before we realize it, a curtain will go up on California's great spectacle. And when you come, you'll find among many great exhibits a DuPont wonder world of chemistry. You'll find it in the homes and garden buildings. You'll find it fascinating to follow spectacular achievements of chemical research. The astounding process of making rayon and cellophane transparent film, neoprene, the man-made rubber, and lucite. The crystal clear plastic created from air, water, and coal, and many, many more wonders of our time. Yes, a real glimpse of a wonder world of chemistry, not only at the San Francisco World's Fair, but also at the great New York World's Fair to open before long near the skyscrapers of Manhattan. And thus, on each coast, DuPont will tell a vital and vibrant story of better living for America. But most important of all, these exhibits will show what scientific research is doing to make jobs, to keep people at work. They'll show what chemistry's discoveries in 1938 will mean in good living, in years which loom ahead. Good and hopeful years, expressed in a timeless DuPont pledge. Better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Cavalcade of America. Next week, our story is about Edward Bach, an immigrant boy who came to America from the shores of Holland and by his coming made his adopted country a better place to live in. Until next week, then, at this same hour, good night and best wishes for the new year from DuPont. <laughs> <laughs> 